My name is Melissa Chan. Thanks for joining us, both those in person and online. We're in conversation with Nafiha Sayed, CEO of The Markup. Welcome to RightsCon. I think you're on mute. Oh, I'm... Oh, there you are. We've got you. Hi. There, here I am. Here <laughs> I am. Thank you so much for having me. Hello from smoky, cloudy New York. Oh, gosh. I've been reading about that. It sounds absolutely crazy. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So very quickly, some housekeeping for everyone. If you have questions, please post them through Slido, whether you're online or in person. I have my laptop here. I check it throughout the conversation, so we're not going to just wait until the end um, to read your questions. So whatever you hear we're t uh, us talking about, um, drop your question in, and we'll integrate it into the conversation. So um, let's just start by asking you to introduce the markup. Yeah, absolutely. So the Markup is a nonprofit news organization that exists to challenge technology to serve the public good. So many technologies are designed um, with profit motive in mind, with scale in mind, and not centering sort of what is the way in which this is serving the public. And we think a critical part of serving the public is actually informing the public and stakeholders in, in carrying out that good, the details of what's going on. And that's not an anecdote here or there. That is doing so with data. And so our sort of secret sauce is that we will approach a problem and we will quantify where people have questions. Sometimes that means building software like Blacklight that now has had 10 million uses to be a real-time privacy inspector. Sometimes that means scraping data from Meta or Amazon. Sometimes that means filing public records requests. But we take a critical eye and a quantitative eye towards harms that we're observing in order to share that with the public and industry stakeholders and policy stakeholders to get some real change. Great, could you give us a little bit more uh, detail, like uh, 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 the example you just mentioned uh, and explain it in a little bit more in depth so people can conceptualize it? Yeah, of course. So why don't I take us back to uh, in 2020, uh, right? Mm -hmm. When we launched, we launched uh, two weeks before New York went into lockdown. Wow. And something happened that I think many, many folks experienced in sort of different but unified ways. And we realized just how reliant we were on technology. If you wanted to go to the doctor, you were using telehealth. For many, if you wanted to go to school, you were using an ed tech platform. If you wanted to work, you were often using Zoom or a sort of chat platform like what we're using now. And the technology was the connective tissue for so many of our lives. Okay, maybe we know that, but what we didn't always know is what the invisible trade was or is every time we use those kinds of platforms. The data that is extracted, often without our consent, without our knowledge, without our granular understanding of what's going on because it's buried into a privacy policy somewhere, mm -hmm. that trade isn't always in the calculus, not always surfaced. And there's certainly a thicket of data privacy laws, not only in the United States where I sit, but globally that can affect this, but they're not always enforced against all of these different actors. So we set out to say, well, why don't we help pull back the curtain and understand where is your, you know, taking control of your data requires you knowing where it's being taken from and then understanding the various ways that it's going to be used, whether it's used in a, about a decision specifically about you, mm -hmm. like if you apply to get a mortgage or if you're searching for information about reproductive care online, mm -hmm. or if it's being used to feed a training model or um, you know, some sort of AI algorithm down the way. And so we really start with where is our data being extracted and how does that work? So Blacklight, which I mentioned, mm -hmm. is a real-time privacy inspector tool. Anyone can use it. Go to themarkup.org slash blacklight. Put in a website that you tend to go to, and it will show you are there cookies extracting your information? Are there key loggers? Are there other things that are taking part in that invisible trade that you maybe did not realize? Um, because, you know, we've heard the news about what entities like Meta are doing, but maybe not when you go to buy dog food or mm -hmm. look up information on WebMD or what have you. And so we build software like Blacklight. We'll also build investigations on the data and the insights that we have from that type of software. So we would, we've would we taken a critical look at the amount of information being extracted from people when they visit nonprofit websites. 
websites that provide to them information. Mm. We have done investigations on how much information is extracted from you when you are filing for financial aid mm. uh, to go to college uh, or inquiring about healthcare information on websites that you might think have protections because it's health information, but actually a tracking pixel is right in between extracting otherwise sensitive information. So th that's just a snapshot of some of the work that we do. Uh, it sounds like you're combining journalism with sort of consumer service, like sort of like a old school consumer reports sort of service with public service all rolled into one. Is that kind of a good takeaway from what you've just described? Yeah, I think it's a good takeaway. I think the layer that I would add to that sandwich is that we have tremendous tech expertise on staff. And I think that expertise helps us ask the right questions. So we're not coming at things from a anti-tech perspective. We're coming from the perspective, we know you can be better. We know that there is a way to inculcate the public good into what's happening. And we're going to show you exactly how that works. Um, and, and, and by asking sort of granular questions. So I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. um, we just did, I think one of my favorite stories we've done at the markup is about a vulnerability scoring index used by the city of Los Angeles to determine who gets housing if they're unhoused and who doesn't. Mm. And, and social workers were asked to perform this score, put it into the system, and then they would get an answer about whether someone you know, was able to get housing or not. And often the output didn't match the inputs. And this was sort of anecdotally known amongst social workers. It was known with government workers that like something weird was happening, but it was part of a contract and it had been signed and there wasn't really much one, it seemed like, much one could do about it. Mm. So we decided to roll up our sleeves and take a look, um, get get the data around it, really understand and test what was going on that we were able to do because of our technical expertise, including the tremendous skills of investigative reporting alongside sort of engineering and data skills. And we were able to show exactly why this was happening and to quantify it. Now, I think that act of quantification is a really important layer. Often people, communities know that harm is happening in a vague way. Yeah. Policy may hear about it, but they don't know exactly where to click in to make mm -hmm. a change. And that's where journalism, that's where information, that's where data can really help because it shows you exactly where the problem is. And if you define a good problem set, you right. can have the right solution set too. In an earlier conversation today with um, another newsroom, the journalist and I were talking about um, connecting to the readers or news consumers. And one of the important aspects of that is storytelling. Uh, what you've sort of laid out is all the fascinating to you and me, nuts and bolts, the data. How do you bring in the human story into this? Is that something that the markup uh, wants to uh, tell, or are you taking journalism with a different approach? Oh, the, I love this question because centering the human story is why we do this work, right? Marrying the data with what does it feel like for a human being to experience this is so critical. And a great example of this is a story that we just published a little while ago about a school scoring algorithm, a dropout risk algorithm in Wisconsin. Mm. And this algorithm would determine predictive based on its inputs, who was likely to fail out or not fail out before graduating high school. And the problem was that the algorithm was sort of stupid as many of these are. <laughs> um, and uh, the student perspective in this story is so worth reading because the students described what it felt like to be aware that this risk score was out there, right? That it became this way to sort of try and decode some of the feedback they were getting from teachers. Like, are people dismissing you because you've gotten this bad score? Are you being written off before you've even been given a fair chance? And I think the story does this exceptional job at centering the voices of the students who are going through the system and giving you a peek of what it feels like, right, to have systems that are opaque, that feel large, that feel impenetrable, for you to make decisions about everyday factors of your life. And we sort of repeat that same approach when we talk about 
mortgage algorithms that decide, you know, what kind of mortgage you get or other types of risk algorithms that are out there. It's really about saying, you know, we can talk about the system all day, but let's center the human being. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about what it means for that human being. Let's empathize with that human being and then use that as a starting point for when we talk about solutions. I mean, a lot of the things that you've mentioned are flashpoints right now in U.S. politics. So I'm a little curious about the future uh, stories that you're hoping to work on thematically. Could you share a little bit with us um, future plans that the newsroom has? Yeah, absolutely. So education continues to be a focus of ours, and education is certainly a flashpoint in the United States these days, um, whether it's a battle between public charter and religious schools or even the words, the identities that we can embrace and uphold in public schools, right? You can see what's happening in Florida around sort of don't say gay bans or bans of books. Like education seems so right mm -hmm. for, um, for our continued attention because it is also a site where outsourcing, where technology, where ed tech, ed tech platforms see a lot of opportunity, right? So anything that is a rich site for surveillance, we want to pay attention to that. Same with immigration and surveilled communities in the United States. That's going to be a huge issue uh, and a huge area of focus. And one that's so close to my heart, especially because I'm sitting here in smoky New York, right. is climate. Really taking a look at the intersection between climate and technology. We just did an interview a couple months ago with researchers that um, in their calculations determined that asking chat GPT 20 to 50 questions used 500 milliliters of water in terms of all the processing power it needs. Now, if you think about the user base of ChatGPT, given that it's all of the hype around it and the adoption rate, that's a lot of clean water that's mm -hmm. being used for compute that is, a, as we know, a scarce resource for so much of the world. And so really taking a critical lens to look at not just carbon footprint, not just electricity, but water as well as an issue that affects tech. Mm -hmm. is something that is also that we'll uh, be paying attention to. Well, you can well imagine that at this RightsCon conference, a lot of people have been talking about generative AI. And I wonder mm -hmm. if the markup, uh, I mean, frankly, what are your personal thoughts about it? And also whether the newsroom is going to report on it and how? Yeah, and we're already starting to, um, you know, we're, we're, uh, there's a lot of tech expertise on staff. And so I think the fluency um, with AI and understanding, thinking through how to ethically apply it with our, within our organization is live. Um, I've done a, a number of interviews for the, um, for the organization with various experts on issues like ethics around the training data uh, that has often been taken from artists and creators without compensation. What are the ethics and the copyright legal issues around that, the environmental impacts um, and that sort of thing. I think on my own, my own personal viewpoint is that at the moment we're in a, there's a legitimate set of concerns and there's the hype concerns where people want to talk about, you know, killer robots tomorrow. Mm. And I'm like, or you could focus on stupid algorithms today, right? Algorithmic decision making is already here. It, it has already been disrupting the lives of many. And I think some part of AI hype is also about that disruption climbing up the class ranks and making people feel a little hot under the collar for what it might mean for white collar jobs, for policy jobs, for mm. creator jobs. And I, I think it's a moment to recognize first how disruption has already really meant something for many people's lives and livelihoods, like the warehouse workers that are surveilled for every second of their time within the warehouse, or the nurses whose RFID tags track how quick their pace is to make sure that they're seeing as many patients as they can. You know, this desire to automate everything, and that's made in some ways easier because of the capabilities of AI is really something to reckon with, right? What have we already done and what is that? How does that set a base for where we're about to go? Um, stepping back a little bit, I mean, I think for me, uh, my real critique around AI where I'm very interested, I'm interested in its capabilities, mm -hmm. absolutely. Right. Um, I'm also interested in the way that AI tends to centralize power. Um, AI it can be used, an algorithmic decision-making generally um, can be used at massive scale and it's quite cheap. Its capability for having simple errors and encoding bias as a result of that at scale is something to be acutely aware of. Um, an area very close to my heart is um, 
often these systems are rolled out with very few avenues for recourse. Mm-hmm. If something is wrong, who do you talk to, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, if, you, if you see a bad outcome, is there someone you can appeal to? Sometimes, like in the homelessness uh, vulnerability scoring um, example in Los Angeles, there is actually a way to appeal your score. But do people know about it? How can we help them know about it is a critical part of the conversation. Um, and I think, you know, these ways in which power is being uh, centralized in these systems is it worthy of scrutiny and exactly why we need journalism on this topic to exist. Well, it's very exciting that you're going to focus on that. It sounds like you guys really have, um, can I just say this, your shit together uh, in the newsroom. <laughs> <laughs> it's very it's very encouraging to hear journalists speak um, about technology with such facility. Uh, you have the right lexicon, and as you mentioned earlier, the journalists in your newsroom seem to have the tools um, and the uh, understanding about tech to really cover these stories. There's a question coming in uh, asking, how do you balance your organization's role in advancing data-driven journalism with your advocacy and development of tools to hold tech companies accountable, which is, I kind of asked this, but I think that, I think it's worth pursuing it a little bit more, right? The consumer service, public service, journalism rolled into one. Yeah, it's it's certainly a tricky one, right? So if there's a version of journalism that we think of as being entirely neutral, takes no sides, has no perspective on anything, that I think would be a hard universe for us to live in. The universe in which journalism says our job is actually to uncover harms. And if calling something a harm is advocacy, right, then, you know, th- that's, that's a different universe. I actually don't think that's advocacy. I think that's saying there is a harm here. Advocacy is the bucket that comes after that says, and now you should be regulated. Now you should be fined. Now you should be legislated. What to do with the harm is the realm of advocacy. But it's, to me, squarely the wheelhouse of journalism to say, this is a harm. People are being hurt here. And for us, the markup approach to that is, here's how many. Here's exactly how. Here's the ways where it might be intentional. Here's the way it might not be intentional because it is bias encoded into a system that has become deployed by people who don't understand its complexity. And so I think there's this this moment that happens before advocacy Mm. where you show up, identify the harm, do so with specificity. That's our lane. And that actually feels really comfortable for, for me and the folks at the market. The other question I want to ask you is the business model, which is the question that every newsroom struggles with. And you guys launched in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, Can you explain how you think this, how it works now and how you hope it will work in the future in terms of sustaining your newsroom? This is such a great question. And so, you know, we are an organization that is supported by philanthropy. We were launched because of the wonderful contributions of Craig Newmark, the Ford Foundation, the MacArthur Foundation, um, the Arizona Community Foundation, um, and to date have over 500 different donors um, and have raised uh, just over $29 million. Um, But philanthropy isn't a long-term sustainability goal, right? You need to have the input of your members. You need to have support from your members. And that is, you know, truly critical to the business model. I think there's maybe a universe, and I would say this universe is far down the line, um, not far, maybe like 18 to 24 months, where maybe in some of the software that we build or the tools that we create, there is some sort of licensing or membership possibility that's there. We've really focused on this in this early stage in building up the fil- access to philanthropic capital um, for ourselves in order to position ourselves, build the brand, build the base, and then be able to go on and build um, membership and licensing and other sort of revenue models as a result. Um, and and it's, it's not easy. We're really fortunate to have access to that amount of money. Um, what I will also say is, you know, when you think about it in tech, when you think about sort of the David and Goliath aspect of this, you know, if we're an organization that has a $6 million a year budget, and all of these are numbers you can see in our various annual reports online, uh, you know, $143 million uh, is the budget of data brokers just in the last two years. 
it's 34, I think, trillion dollars, the market cap of Facebook, Amazon, and Google. When we're talking about the amount of money to train a large AI model, we're talking about $100 million, right? So if we look at this sort of David and Goliath positioning, $6 million sounds like a lot, but if we're going to talk about systems that are so big and so widely adopted, we might need a bigger slingshot to do this kind of work. Um, and, and thinking about how we have sustainable public interest oriented organizations that also are able to stand up uh, and interrogate mm. powerful entities, whether they are governments or whether they're large companies, this is a real, it's a real issue. And I will say I'm, I'm trained as a media lawyer. I spent the last decade of my life before I came to the markup uh, defending journalists and filmmakers who found themselves um, at the wrong end of the spear uh, mm -hmm. being, you know, sued for truth telling. And so I know just how expensive and how valuable money really is in the endeavor of telling the truth. And so that's just another reason for us to keep refining and tinkering with our business model to make sure we can be confident mm -hmm. in defending our work, whatever the arena happens to be. I just, I've just been thinking about the number of grant applications you guys have had to fill out as a result to raise <laughs> that kind of money. And my God, it's not fun. And it's not, as you say, sustainable, which leads me to the next question, which is the fact that there are a lot of people at RightsCon from the Global South. Um, mm -hmm. Is your model at the markup replicable? Have you had conversations with people and journalists in other countries interested in replicating the markup's model? I love this question, and this is an area for us where I, in my dream universe, we would be able to expand thoughtfully into. Where we've had the most inbounds from the Global South um, is around our tools. So Blacklight, which I mentioned, is a tool that anyone can use. Um, and we've seen researchers use it to interrogate how universities are collecting information that they maybe didn't realize or what, you know, what websites in their in their own countries are being used to um, that are tracking information when you're accessing it, which if you're talking about, you know, politically sensitive information, no matter where you are, you want to know who's watching you as you're doing it. And so our tools, we also build um, uh, other privacy preserving sort of software approaches, like here's how to use, uh, here's how to embed a tweet without trackers in it. Here's how a link shortener that you can use that doesn't have any trackers in it, whereas Bitly does. We build those kinds of tools in order to reach folks broadly, including in the global South. Although, you know, to, to check privilege a little bit, we're publishing in English, right? We're not, we're not publishing in a variety of different languages. So I can say that this is designed for the global South, but I have to own the fact that the language is a choice that we're making that is making ourselves not accessible to everybody. And so that's why I say in my dream universe, I think there'd be a way that we would be reaching, translating into existing in a variety of different contexts, but we are in our third year of operation. So, so we're, you know, we're trying to walk before we don't, before we run in terms of the actual models replicability, not just using what we're doing. Mm. Right. Um, I, I think the model on one level, the model of pairing, um, public interest technologists, developers, tech expertise with the journalists is certainly one that you could see uh, replicated as a model. Doing so at a $6 million scale is going to really depend on the philanthropic environment that a particular country happens to be in. And that is where I can see a lot of challenge. Now, of course, the cost might be different depending on where you are and cost of living. So I think there's one level of the model that I would love for people to borrow. Mm. Um, I think numeracy and tech literacy paired with journalism is very important. But recognizing that capital con sets of constraints and the limits of philanthropy is very real. And I don't want to be too pie in the sky about it. Great. Uh, we've had a very shy audience, so that there was just that one question. <laughs> I think let's just end with any final thoughts that you'd like to say, maybe anything I didn't cover, and then we'll wrap it from there. Uh, I think I would just say so much of journalism's success is actually not rooted in anything the journalist does, but what the audience does with it. And so, you know, our dream is that people read our work and then they decide to do something. And that's not just liking it and sharing it, although that's great. It's thinking about whether there are ethical choices you need to be making in your own life, whether there are people that you should be sharing it with, whether there's 
political representatives that you should be sharing it with, whether you actually are in an industry where maybe when you go to work, there's something you can say of like, hey, actually, we should think about to auditing this product before we deploy it. Um, I guess I would ask people to think that in all these spheres they operate in, what is some power that they have? Not what who has all of the power. What is some power that you hold and are you wielding it in a way that is trying to improve things for everybody? Um, because if you show up in the world with that, we can show up with the information that we can surface and in, in handing it off to you and you exercising your power, real ma magic, real change can happen. And that's the alchemy that makes this all so promising and exciting. Well, on that note, thank you so much for joining us, Nabiha Syed. Thank you so much for having me. And that's it from RightsCon Studio. As always, enjoy the rest of the afternoon and stay engaged. <laughs>